and go back with me to 1985, London, England, Wembley Arena, sites of great athletic events and fantastic rock and roll concerts. Yeah. This was the World Kickboxing Championships, the toughest martial arts tournament in the world at the time. Why? Because it was a round robin tournament. You fought all day. If you win, you're in. If you're out, you're out. I won all day. Started at 9 a.m., 9 o'clock that night. 20,000 spectators. I walk into the middle of the ring, and of course, you just stare right ahead, and all I see is this guy's chest. <laughs> I look up, and it's Halloween's Hoffman from Germany. Great guy, nice guy, but he was huge, muscular German. I sat there, I stood there, I'm just thinking, all right, then you go back to your corner, you're waiting to make an announcement. So introducing people into the ring, I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> I mean, how did I get here? I was, I was raised as a, I was a chubby, fat kid in Largo, Florida, which is lower middle class, working class family. In my family, the mantra was, we can't afford it. Whatever it was. I mean, mommy, I'm on a comic book, we can't afford it. So I was raised with tremendous money stress. The other aspect of the communication, obviously, is my parents weren't teachers. They were screamers. When you did something that they didn't appreciate, they didn't say, son, let me show you how to do it right. They just started screaming. And eventually, you got some worse code. <laughs> they, you know, it's not that they didn't love us. It's just that they were raised at a time where spare the rod and spoil the child was their mantra. It's the quickest way. You don't have to think about it, just whack a kid a few times and on your way. So when you get yelled at like that when you're a kid, for me, it just took me into a shell. I became extremely shy, extremely bashful. I can recall in second grade, Mildred Helms Elementary School. I went two and three days without talking to another kid. I didn't, I just, somebody said, hi, go. And then my mom said one day, how's school going? You making some friends? I said, I think so. Because this one kid had stared at me and made eye contact with me for five or 10 seconds longer than most of the other kids. So I kind of thought maybe we had a connection there. So that's the depth of the shyness that I had. I started training in the martial arts in 1974. I knew from my first class, February 12, 1974, that I was going to do this for the rest of my life. And boy, it is so liberating when you are blessed with finding something that really inspires you. Because here's where you want to get, gang. This is really important. It's called self-actualization. You guys know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Boy, you get to the top of that, self actualization and this is what happens. Your work is your play. Your work is your play. You, you're, you're confused about the two. And from the time I earned my black belt in 1978, I had completely redefined my identity. I went from the shy kid to being a black belt. The only real job I've ever had is I was a busboy for a while and a waiter. So during the day, at 17 years old or 18 years old, it was, Graydon, clear off table number six. Yes, sir. At nighttime, it was, Mr. Graydon, would you talk to my son? He's having some trouble in school, and he looks up to you so much. What do you think jazz me? <laughs> so at that early stage, I was in a position where I was starting to embrace something I really cared for. And I encourage you, imagine, here's the question to you. If you could not fail and you could do, you had to do an activity to help other people, what would that activity be? And from this point forward, focus your energies on that activity. One of my mentors told me if I spend an hour a day studying one particular subject, within a year I'll be an expert. Within five years, people will start paying me for my expertise. That is exactly what happened. I continued my martial arts training. I finally was persuaded to open a karate school. I was teaching at a college. You know, and that's not commercial. You guys gotta be there anyways, I could kill you. It wouldn't make a difference. I get paid the same whether I, I, how I taught you. Then a friend of mine persuaded me to actually open a martial arts school. My fear was I had no business experience, that I would make a fool of myself trying to run a real business. And I started out pretty good. I made $5,000 gross in the first month. 
By six months later, I was almost out of business. I was grossing less than $1,000 a month to run the entire business. Rent itself was $3,000. I mean, it was a bad situation. So I started to study other martial arts schools that were doing a lot better. They had, I, st I studied martial arts schools that had two criteria. Number one, the instructor had to have a six-figure income. Number two, he had to produce really good black belts, because that was very important to me, quality. And I started to take the ideas that I learned from these guys, implement them into my school. Within a year, I was highly profitable. Within two years, I had a six-figure income. This is 1987, so you can do the math. That's right. And I've never had less than a six-figure income, income since then. I wrote a book, and I'm going to encourage you to find a topic and start writing your book. Monday. Doesn't, nobody's going to read it. <laughs> but in time, you'll understand the, the, the power of this. I wrote a book in 1993 called Black Belt Management. I sold it for $149. Here's a tip. If you write a book and get it printed like a regular book, 20 bucks maybe you can get for it. If you write a book and put it in a three ring binder, it's a manual and you can charge 149 bucks for it. Same exact content people will buy. I sold over a thousand of them in a year. I paid off my house and I was at a convention, kind of like this. I was getting ready to take the stage and the convention host walks up with a box of cards and it says, John Grady, Executive Director, National Association of Professional Martial Arts. He goes, John, you're the only guy that can do this. And that was the first professional association for the martial arts industry. I created that along with the first trade journal for the martial arts industry. So I went from being this shy, chubby kid who had to shop in the husky aisle for his pants to being a world kickboxing champion with a six-figure income and tremendous influence. But here's what's interesting. I talked about how I redefined myself. I used the martial arts to help me redefine myself, but what I discovered in time is that the journey was only halfway done. I became Karate Guy around town. Everybody knew me as Karate Guy. I, was, I had a TV show for a decade. I was on TV three times a week. I'd go to a restaurant and sign autographs as Karate Guy. But what I eventually realized is Karate Guy is not me. It's like that girl in the poetry, the spoken word yesterday. The, she, my poetry is not me. It's an extension of me. And it wasn't until the last 10 years that I started to stand that martial arts is an extension of me. It does not define me. But when you immerse yourself into something you love for a long period of time, that will become your identity. But you have to complete the journey and come out the other side. So that is my story in terms of my background with leadership. I generated over $30 million in a decade. I have taught many people, thousands of people on three decades, success principles I'm gonna share with you today. So to help you understand this process, I've created a short little acronym, it's called CAST. C-A-S-T. And I used CAST, and I made this up probably a solid 72 hours ago for you guys. <laughs> CAST, I love because think about the leadership ability of a director of a film or a producer. <coughs> a guy's a producer of a movie, okay? He gets the script, he gets pitched, he gets the go-ahead, he's given a hundred million dollars to make this film. What does he have to do in terms of leadership? He's got to pull in a director, egotistical actors, everybody all the way down to catering. Essentially, he's got $100 million to put together a team, lead them, and then answer for that money nine months later. And then when it's over, they're all unemployed again. Isn't that interesting? I love Los Angeles. I love the film business. I love the music business because it's the marriage of creativity and wealth. Wealth by itself is not interesting to me. Making money just to make money doesn't interest me. Doing something that's creative and helps people, that gets me up in the morning. Here's a simple test. What's going on in your life? I think you're sneaking on me. <laughs> Sunday night, before you have to get up on Monday and get ready to go to bed, how excited are you about Monday morning? Well, Ooh. most people, you know. But, well, that's it. When you are living your dreams and you're doing what you love to do, let's say that your big thing is Internet marketing, your big thing is magazine production, your big thing is whatever it could be, it doesn't matter. In today's world, it is truly a world of brain over brawn. And I was in an industry 
that promoted brawn. <laughs> and I was, hope, uh, I was happy to introduce brain. All right, so C. The C in CAS stands for communication. This is the number one, top of the list. Nothing's more important in your skills as a leader as communication. And I'm going to help you understand communication, I think, in a way you haven't heard before. Let's start with the most important communication of all. Does anybody have any idea what that might be? Talking? Talking? Listening. Body. 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 So body language. What else? Listening. Listening. Okay. Those are all great answers. The most important communication you can possibly have is with yourself. It is your self-talk. Nothing determines the ceiling of your potential. Nothing determines how you view your potential than your self-talk. <coughs> On a scale of one to 10, how important is self-talk? 10, 11, 12, it's off the charts, right? How come they don't teach us how to talk to ourselves in school? How come they don't help us understand this dialogue that we have from about age five? You start to have this running dialogue with yourself. And that dialogue is influenced by your program. When I say programming, you guys heard about conditioning, your conditioning. I like the idea of programming. Aristotle was the first one to introduce this idea of a blank slate, that your mind is a blank slate. And I like, in today's world, I think about your computer doesn't have an operating system yet. And at about age five, your parents, your teachers, the clergy, the community, and the media start to program your mind. So that by the time you're right around now, you're developing a model of the world based upon your program. Guys, this is power. Here's the deal. Your programming was installed without your permission. Your programming was installed without you knowing it. You have two minds. Always remember this. When you, and I'm gonna illustrate this for you later. You have the outer mind, which is the conscious mind. Some people call it the left mind. I always get left and right mixed up. Which one's the logical mind? Left, I think, right? Yeah, left brain. I like the outer mind because I like it. I like outer mind and inner mind. The outer mind is the conscious mind. It's the one that is analytical. <clears throat> it gets you to, you know, where are my keys? What's my dog's name? That kind of stuff. Where am I at? Inside the mind is the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind never forgets anything. There are some studies that show that from the time you're in the womb, the subconscious mind is recording what's going on around you. So it's very creepy because when you're young and you're hearing, you know, a lot of times, I had a, a, a coaching client that had a, a real weight problem. She was 320 pounds at five foot one. She was a little wider than she was tall. And it wasn't eating that was the problem. <coughs> when she was a young girl, she had been sexually abused by someone. And her mother, in a hope to try and make her feel okay about it, says, oh, that's because you're so pretty. The subconscious mind immediately went to work to protect her to make sure that never happens again. And becoming very heavy was the quickest way to make sure she didn't have that experience again. So it had nothing to do with food. It had nothing to do with reducing calories. It had to do with dealing with what she had programmed in her subconscious mind. Here's the thing about programming. The subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's not real. Have you ever walked into a room and you caught yourself in the mirror and you know jumped and got in your karate stance and you thought <laughs> there was a bad guy there or something? Logically, your mind knows there's nobody there. It's a reflection in the mirror. But your the, 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 the image bypassed the conscious mind right to the subconscious mind. You jump in your karate stance. You ever been in a car and stomped on an imaginary brake in the passenger seat? You know? <laughs> Guys, have you ever watched a movie with a girlfriend and it's an emotional movie and you're just trying to go, okay, this, this is getting pretty heavy. I don't want to cry in front of this. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, I, I'm that way. I cry during commercials. Uh, that's the subconscious mind at work. Here's a great example. I'm watching Miss Saigon, which is a fantastic stage, but I love Broadway musicals. Second time I saw it, though, because at the end of Miss Saigon, there is a heart-wrenching scene. And I'm, I'm there with a bunch of buddies, and I'm thinking, okay, I know this is coming up. 
So I try and detach my subconscious mind from it. I'm looking at the lights. I'm saying, wow, that's a very interesting drape. Oh, look how close to the stage. And that goes with a nice dress on. Everything I can do possibly to avoid what's about to happen. And then, pow, there's this auditory stimulus that signifies the scene. And right away, of course, you know, when the lights came up, you could see virtually everybody else was in the same boat. So here's the point. Your programming governs your patterns of thought, your patterns of behavior. Studies show that we're in automatic behavior patterns 88% of the day. What does that mean? These are things that you're doing without thinking about. The way you put your clothes on, the way you brush your teeth, the way you tie your shoes, the way you drive to work. Remember the first time you drove a car and you felt like I'm detached from this big 2,000 pound monstrous thing and last week you're driving and you don't even remember getting there? Your subconscious mind drove the car while your conscious mind thought about what you're gonna do that day, um, it was my homework in, what that girl said last night, all that kind of stuff. So what we have to do is understand that if our programming isn't serving us, we have to reprogram ourselves. We have to reprogram ourselves. So how do you know if your programming is serving you? You are perfectly programmed right now for the life that you have. You're perfectly programmed for the life that you have. If you're really satisfied with your life, then your programming is serving you. If there are areas in your life that you would like to modify, you want to upgrade to you 2.0. That's the way I look at it. And that's reprogramming the mind. I'm gonna discuss with you some ways to do that. So when we talk about our internal dialogue, here are three strategies to improve your self-talk. The vast majority of us have negative self-talk. For instance, I see an attractive girl, I make my approach, I get shot down. But God, I'm such an idiot. If I just had more money, if I just had more hair, if I just had, you know, all that stuff. Or I make it a presentation and it doesn't go quite as good as I want it to go. I really screwed that one up. Oh, man. What an idiot. Pretty typical self talk Here's what you want to do when you made a presentation, made an approach, or whatever it is, and it didn't go the way you wanted, what went well about that? What was good? Then what will I do different next time? See, that's a totally different mindset. People who struggle in life hold on to the emotions of the past. See, I'm walking away from that girl, that presentation, thinking, oh, those guys, they won't listen in, or oh, I'm really joking. I'm just carrying the emotion. I'm not carrying any of the lessons. The lessons are the most important part. So if I come out of that going, okay, what well, looked good about that? All right, I made eye contact with her, I turned, I didn't freak her out, she didn't slap me and run away. <laughs> what will I do differently next time? I'll change my question, I'll make a different question. Or what will I do differently about the presentation or the homework assignment? Does that make sense to you guys? So this idea of, it's called, I call it the give yourself a chance strategy. Catch yourself coming down on yourself. You have, you make probably 10, 20,000 comments to yourself over the course of the week. If 95% of them are negative, do you think eventually your subconscious mind is gonna start believing it? You're dang right. If your parents never gave you praise as a kid, you know, it's hard to take praise from somebody else. If mommy didn't say it, it can't be true. I mean, it's very important we realize our programming was installed without our permission and without us knowing. So it's important for us to reprogram. How do we continue reprogramming? Read books about people you admire. Study people who have thought patterns you want to emulate. How do millionaires think? How do leaders think? I can assure you they don't think like most of us think. So we want to, it's called modeling. I'm going to ask you this question. If I was to ask you to say, okay, I want you to come up here in front of the entire class and convince them you're blind, what would you do? <laughs> Take off your glasses, okay? And then, then what would happen? We wouldn't know because your glasses are off that you couldn't see. What might tell us? Bumping into things, tripping. kind of reaching, tripping. Uh, yeah. Uh, how, how about body posture? Would it be uh, upright here, or would it be kind of reaching? Okay. Here's the same question. What if I asked you to come up here and convince everybody you're a strong leader? What would your physiology be then? Where would your shoulders be? 
Straight. 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 Looking straight ahead. Eye contact. Eye contact. Very important. You gotta fake it till you make it. And here's one of the most important things about self-talk. All of us fake it till we make it. One of the important my new book is called The Imposter Syndrome. The imposter syndrome is this. It's the feeling that you're not as smart, talented, or skilled, or as attractive as everyone else thinks you are. It's a feeling like you've been faking it, and you've been an intellectual fraud, and you may be found out anytime soon. Eight out of 10 of you in this room know exactly what that means, because that's the feeling that you have. And it's important to recognize this. And here's the thing. Successful people know they have to fake it until they make it. How do you think the guy who does you know, brain surgery for the first time feels when he's going over that first head? I mean, there's a big step. I talked to this guy last week. I explained the imposter syndrome to him. He says, oh my God, I have a friend who's a brain surgeon. He said that when I moved from working on cadavers to actually working on a real person, <laughs> it, I had to fake it. I had to act as though I had been doing this for years. Or obviously the patient's gonna freak out. So all of us fake it until we make it, and that's okay. But people with the imposter syndrome, they think they're the only ones. And they think they're the only ones that can be found out. So just give yourself a big, ah, it's not just me. So internal communications determines your external communication. So let's move on to external communications. Because this is where the rubber meets the road. But you understand how internally you create mental breaks that can make it difficult to communicate, that can make it difficult to become a good leader. External communications, let's go back again to the Greeks. This might open a door or turn air or something. It is burning up here, unless it's just me. Yeah, yeah you hot. guys just nothing like talking to a group that's really trying to engage. It's hot. Okay, open the door. Let's get some fans in Big fans. So I say, that's my biggest fan. External communications, the Greeks, I, again, I think I go back to Aristotle, that's a brain. They broke into three areas. Pathos, which is the emotion, emotional content. Ethos, which is the credibility and character of the speaker. And logos, 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 L-O-G-O-S, which is the logical part. Which is probably the most important of all three. Logic, ladies, emotion. Guys, that's, it. that's how guys answer. <laughs> Ethos is the character and credibility of the speaker. So here's what you have to do, gang. When you make your presentations, first, we want to make a connection. In other words, we want them to know that in some point, I think the other door is well, please. In some point, I was like you, or we're the same. It's not ever a good idea to come to an audience as though you're the elevated one, because you create, this, there's a big chasm, there's a disconnect between you and your audience. How did I start this seminar? I took you back to the World Championships, and then I talked about me being a fat, shy kid. And I saw a lot of heads nodding like that, or shy kid, because I am just like you guys. I'm just like you guys. I'm just, I, I, I've got 20 years of experience that I'm giving you right now. All right, so the emotional connection is critically important. The credibility of the speaker. You know, there's the old story of a, 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 a scorpion or a frog. You guys heard that story before? The frog wants to get across the, the, the river. The scorpion, uh, the scorpion wants to get across a little stream. The frog can get across it. The scorpion says to the frog, help me out. I need to get across the, the screen. And the frog says, you're a scorpion. I'm not going to touch. I'm not getting anywhere near you. He goes, no, really, honestly. Help me across the stream, and I'll let you go. There'll be no problems. So the frog says, OK, climb on. So he swims across the stream real fast, gets across. Get across the stream, scorpion saps him right away. And he lays on his back as he's dying. goes, you told me you weren't going to zap me. He goes, yeah, but I'm a scorpion. The scorpion is a scorpion is a scorpion. So credibility is a critical aspect of your presentations. You have to walk the talk. It doesn't mean you have to have tremendous success behind you already. 
know what's very, guys, I'll tell you what's very attractive to women is ambition. Doesn't mean you've got to have it already, but you're hungry for it. That's good. That, that, that bypasses the, the critical mind right to the subconscious mind. Ladies, would you agree that you'd like to be around somebody who's got something going for them? It's even sometimes even more exciting than what they've done in the past. Yeah, see, I don't want to talk about <laughs> All right, so credibility. So how do you establish credibility when you're just getting started? Tie yourself to historical characters or events. What would be a good example? <laughs> Um, I see a hand. Yes, ma'am. Um, establishing credibility. Uh, say you have an interest in the criminal justice system by establishing to it as adhere to the Constitution or be familiar with that, uh, its principles. That would be a logical response. Difficult to communicate, maybe. Mm -hmm. How could you bypass the logical mind and go right to the subconscious? Uh, by using criminal justice. Community. When I was growing up, I saw, I heard the speaker, Carl, whatever his name is, who told that wonderful story yesterday. And this man's father was shot dead right in front of his eyes. And when they went to trial, they said it was his fault because he didn't know how to talk to a white man. And from that moment on, I was committed to making sure that doesn't happen again. And that's my level of commitment to changing the criminal justice system, to make it fair for everybody. And I know that's important to you, Connection, and I want you to come with me, and let's make this work. Does that make sense? Does that work for you guys? All right, so you don't, if you don't have the credibility, you piggyback somebody else's. Who is the master of that right now? Obama, the master. Guys, I'm not, in the, I'm not gonna discuss my political slants, Watch him academically to learn how to speak. Watch him academically to learn how to bypass the conscious mind. You watch him academically to learn how he will quickly align with emotions. And then, and then, ask for the check. In sales, it's called asking for that. You finish off the presentation by asking for the voter, asking for the check. Brilliant, probably since Ronald Reagan, I've never seen anybody as good as Barack Obama, the guy is fantastic. And we talk to him about his strategies of leadership. So there's a guy who has very little government experience. So what he does is he taps into Kennedy. He taps into the history. He piggy packs their credibility. And he does it in a great way. So at this early stage in your leadership game, when I was a young black belt, you know, black belt's very hierarchy driven. 10th degree black belt. I mean, these guys are masters. Well, here I have this young buck coming up and telling them that we're going to change their industry. That doesn't go over too well. I was getting hate mail. I was getting threats. I was, <laughs> uh, as in the very early days of the internet, and I was burning it up at an early stage. So, what I did is, okay, good example. One of my conferences, I couldn't get up in front of all these masters and say, you guys have been doing it wrong for a long time. Do it my way. That wouldn't fly. Just like Brock would say, you know, we need some change, vote for me. Instead, I said, through the years, there have been many great leaders who have been vilified and attacked early in their campaigns. Gichi Funkoshi, the creator of Japanese karate. He took Japanese karate to the Okinawans and he caught hell for it. He commercialized it back in the 20s but he's a legend now. Bruce Lee, his writings were so far ahead of anybody else's. That guy was the original MMA master of you. You read his stuff in the 70s, it's so on the money. His life philosophies are great philosophies to follow. And then I talked about Joe Lewis, who's my instructor and a Bruce Lee student. He's like the Tiger Woods of kickboxing back in the 70s. I said, and Joe Lewis, one of the greatest intellects ever. I piggybacked their credibility. And I said, we, you know, essentially, I'm sharing the same experience without saying it. I didn't say I'm like Gichi Budokoshi, I'm like Bruce Lee, I'm like Joe Lewis. I said, when they started their campaign, they were attacked. But look at the monumental changes. And we all stand on the shoulders of these great leaders and pioneers. So, you, like me, 
want us to move forward in a professional manner like the, our pioneers set up for us. Does that make sense? So that's a, a, the martial arts principle of align and redirect. You want to write that down. Align and redirect. We don't meet force straight on. We align with their force and redirect it in the direction we want to go. I talked about um, programming. Here's evidence of programming. The master programmers in our society are advertisers. To the point where you guys have all heard of demographics? You ever heard of psychographics? Psychographics is marketing to programming. The biggest psychographic group in America is called the belongers. 38% of Americans are belongers. Advertisers know that the way to appeal to a belonger's programming is to do ads that are pro-family, that have to do with staying together as a group. Belongers love family. They love to be part of the group. They hate to be singled out. This is the working man and woman of the country. They love the idea of following rules. They love the idea of a civilized society. They don't like hedonism. They value sacrifice. So how do you, and they hate management. They don't trust management. Because when every time one of their friends gets promoted to manager, he changes and becomes one of them. He was nice before, but now he's one of those. Um, I'm gonna ask that door at least to be open, just to try and keep some air coming in here. Unless you guys are getting drowned out by noise. If you are, okay, all right. It's very loud. I did not kind of, all right, well, play it by yours. Oh, good. So how do you advertise to a belonger? Advertising works best, and your messages work best in persuasion by creating pain first. Going back to politicians in Obama. Our health system is broken. Sally Jones, who's got to work three jobs just to be able to afford the medicine for her sick sister. So I create the pain, personalize it, make the connection, and then offer it. So I will change healthcare. Doesn't no details about how, but that's very persuasive. So if you want to advertise to belongers, imagine this. Pain for a belonger is breaking the family up. Pleasure for the belongers keeping the family together. These holidays, everybody's so busy, going in so many directions. Your son and daughter are off to college. Mom lives on the other side of the country. And here you are back in this empty house. How can you enjoy these holidays? Reach out and touch each other with our long distance service. That's a classic belonger ad. Create the pain for the belonger, solve the pain for the belonger. The emulator. The emulator is someone who wants to look like he's wealthy or she's wealthy. These are people that always have the latest fashions on. In Texas, they call that big hat no cow. These are the people the highest debt they run credit cards up like crazy because to them, the most important thing is to look cool, to look sexy. And it's a foolish mindset. It's a foolish program. There's something missing there. But how do you advertise to an emulator? Sex. Coors used to run an ad where they'd have a beautiful girl in a bikini on the beach. And she would fade out and a can of Coors would appear right behind her. And the message was, drink Coors, get sex. And you know, dang well, she's not drinking beer because she can't look like that. But that's the way you, you advertise to those particular uh, groups in the population. So the point again, we have to really recognize that we are all products of our programming. When you understand that we're all products of our programming, it helps you understand how other people act. Here is an important lesson. Everyone thinks they're right. Everyone thinks they're right. The guy that wronged you, the guy that ripped you off, the guy that, you know, sued you, whatever. In their mind, they're working from their program. So it doesn't mean you forgive, uh, I'll take that back, it doesn't mean you condone it. In time you may forgive them, but it helps you to understand how people think, especially as a leader. Let's move down to S. I'm sorry, A, C-A. A is an attracting a great team. <coughs> this is the key measure of a leader. If you do not have followers, you are not a leader. You have to have followers to be a leader. 
Uh, ladies, I'm going to go back to you for time. How much time do I have? 20 minutes or so? Okay, good. Um, all right, so let's talk about attracting the key team. When you're working with people, you must, we talked about communication, now we're going to talk about calibration. You want to calibrate to your team as an individual. This is what I mean. Your organization has certain goals. The individual has certain needs. We're emotional beings first. So our job as good leaders is to calibrate to the needs of our particular team and make sure that that is helping the organization to achieve its goals. There are four steps to learning. This is really important. This applies to everything you learn. Number one, you are unconsciously incompetent. In other words, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never learned how to grapple, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never learned how to fly an airplane, you don't know what you don't know. You're unconsciously incompetent. The next stage, you can get the next stage pretty quickly, is you become consciously incompetent. Now I know what I don't know. I still can't do it, but at least now I know what it is. The third stage is one that you can get stuck at. And this is called being consciously competent. I can do it, but I have to think about it. That's like when you get in front of a group and you, you try to memorize a speech, torture. I never do that. I don't have the brain for that. I'm not that smart. I just know my principles and I follow that. If I'm fighting in a, a, a championship match, I don't have time to think about, oh, there's an opening. I should hit this guy in the ribs. It's long gone by then. Bruce Lee used to say, I didn't hit you in the ribs. You raised your elbow and it happened. And that's the fourth stage. Unconscious competence. I do it without thinking. Driving your car without thinking. Driving your car with your knee, text messaging, flipping the uh, iPod, you know, <laughs> while carrying a conversation on with a girl in the back. That's unconscious incompetence. I'm sorry, unconscious competence. In other words, you don't have to think about it. So guys, as leaders, when you have somebody new come into your group, you must assume and then quickly find out and calibrate where are they at. If they're in the unconscious, they don't know what they don't know. They need a lot of hand-holding, nothing. They need you to really help them out. If they move to the, when they move to the stage of being consciously incompetent, they're kind of starting to get it. You can let go a little bit, right? You can, you can give them a little more freeway, free, for, uh, freedom. The third stage, when they become consciously competent, you, need, you, you don't need to monitor them as much until finally you get to the point where it's, they're unconsciously competent, they're good, and maybe they're as good as you. You kind of monitor what's going on, but you don't need to babysit them as much. That makes sense, everybody? Here's the mistake. Too many of us jump right away to giving them a lot of freedom right off the bat. We don't inspect what we expect. And the problem is that when they start messing up, you got to try and reel them in then. It's a lot harder to go backwards than it is to go forward. Example, there was an emperor of a, 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 a community, a, a country, somewhere, somehow. And he was doing everything. He was doing the rewarding and he was doing the punishing. He said, finally, man, I'm wiped out. He calls in his prime minister and says, look, I'm tired. Let's split this up. I'll do the rewarding as the emperor. As the prime minister, you do the punishing. So they did that for four months, and after a while, the emperor noticed that whatever the prime minister asked for, he got, because they're fear of being punished, right? But in his case, because he was a rewarder, sometimes they would get it, sometimes they're not, because rewards don't always match the needs of the person you're dealing with. So he said, you know, let's, let's switch this around. I'll do the punishing, you do the rewarding now. Within two months, they had thrown him out of the country, dethroned him, and made the prime minister the emperor. Why? Because he went from being Mr. Friendly Reward Guy to suddenly being Mr. Tight Punishment Guy. And as they threw him out, they started to say, you know, they're trying to figure out who to replace him with. They get, you know who's really coming around? That Prime Minister is really... Because <laughs> the Prime Minister went from being the Punishing Guy now to the Rewarding Guy. So the common mistake as managers, as leaders, is that we give too much leeway early. We have to nurture our people. And guys... Good leaders are products of nurture, not nature. That's the idea of a born leader, that's rare. Usually those are people that are programmed early by certain circumstances, and often they're really strange circumstances. If I have more time, I can spend a lot of time on that. S stands for 
vision. Specific vision. Specific vision. And why do I say specific vision? Because it has to be in one or two senses. For my organization now, because in the martial arts, money's a big thing. If you charge too much, you're a mixed dojo. You're a sellout. So my vision that I repeated over and over again is the purpose of NAPMA is to improve the quality of the experience of the student in the classroom, period. Improve the experience, the quality of the experience of the student in the classroom, period. Improve the quality of the experience of the student in the classroom, period. Who could argue with that? Who would be for making it worse? That's not gonna happen. So here's the thing, here's the 3 a.m. rule. You ought to be able to ninja into the bedroom of any one of your uh, team members, slap them in the face, wake them up and say, what's the vision? And if you've done a good job, they'll say, to improve the quality of the experience of student every class, sir. Right there. And go right back out again. It has to be that clear. So you have to have a vision for your organization. You also have to have a vision for your specific events. What are we doing with this event? Are we trying to educate? Are we trying to entertain? Is it a mixture of both? Are we trying to make money? Are we trying to raise awareness? So make sure your team knows the purpose of a specific event you're hosting on campus. Again, you can link to history to help drive home this idea of your vision. Um, and I told you the NAPA story. For Texas, let me Let's say you're running for student government of some sorts. Okay, you could say something like, um, you know, it, when I think about people who have stood up for their principles, I first think about in 1776 a group of people, July 4th, who created the Declaration of Independence. That was a bold move against great odds. And here we are in the great state of Texas, Sam Houston, outnumbered, defeated General Santa Ana to secure the independence of Texas. And then we look at the Houston Space Center. And it's from there, the first time, that a man on the moon, over the lines, Houston, the eagle has landed. That's the kind of power, that's the kind of commitment that I want to have in this organization. That's how I want to lead you. Does that make sense, guys? Again, now what's another part about linking to the past? One's credibility, the rule of three. The rule of three, there is something very powerful about three. So you don't do it with two, you do it with three. And notice also the way that I did that. One, the big distance of the Declaration of Independence, wide encompassing. Then I went to the local, but it was a battle, kind of negative, you know, people dying. But then I went to Houston, the English land. So that's a line in redirect. Now that I say, what I think we ought to do is really have a good student government that's committed to doing new things. I could have said that. I'd have probably not won that vote. I bypassed the logical mind, went right to the subconscious mind. Make sense? Is that valuable, you guys? Good stuff? Okay. Number T, trust. I always say number T or number, or, or, or number next. Trust. How do you go trust? Same way. Eye contact's a big issue. One-on-one, -on -one, eye contact's important, also body language. And I talked to you before, I asked you this question, how would you hold your body if you were trying to convince people you were blind? How would you hold your body if you're trying to convince people you were a poor leader? <coughs> or a powerful leader? So body language is, is really important, and when you're talking with somebody, can I have the beautiful Janet look real quick? <coughs> this is my lovely lady, Janet, please, energy. When you're leading groups and people come up and talk to you, sometimes you'll have lines that people want to talk to you. Here's a common, common mistake, especially in a group setting. Um, just tell me about your morning. Your regular morning routine. Starting to get fit. I get up. Oh, you should get up. Go ahead. Uh huh. Have coffee. Wow, that's interesting. Two things are happening. One here. I'm kind of engaging, then I'm looking around. Huge error. Common error. It's even worse than not looking at all, or just excusing myself, I don't have time. Two, I'm bleeding, or well, leaking, okay, I'll call it leaking. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaking, I'm leaking my energy away from you. Right? I wanna, when, this is what I, I had to teach this to myself, because I would get swamped with these guys. And if you didn't give them the time, you'd get, he's arrogant. You know, if you're shy, nobody knows you, you're shy. When a lot of people know you, 
and you don't, and you're shy, you're no longer shy, you're now arrogant. So I had to learn to turn, take a deep breath, and just relax my shoulders and maintain eye contact. And just maintain, it's a conscious of things. All right, ta -da! isn't she great? <laughs> So, let me think, let me think. What's your speaking to the spirit to bring someone on the problem? Yeah, I'm sure there's a technique for that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I know we're out of trust, but I had a question about specific vision. Fire away. Um, say you said to outline clear goals for the group. Yes, ma'am. Like, if you have a, a programming council and you have a constitution, there are a bunch of goals. Now, for me, logically, that's too, too much information for somebody to remember. So, would you suggest convincing that to an overall? Absolutely. And I would calibrate, again, that word calibrate. Learn to calibrate. Every one of you is different here. And if I was managing you and leading you and trying to get you ready for a world championship or trying to get you ready to lead your group, I would calibrate to your particular needs and communication style. So let's talk about communication style to help you with that. People are, and again, ladies, I'm going to ask you to help me with time. How much? Pardon? 12 minutes. Thanks so much. People are, people have a dominant learning style. Visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. You familiar with this? Okay. So as you make your presentations, and I tell you, Bill Clinton was a master at this, and Obama is, he's like a 10th degree black belt. I know in this audience, I have people that are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So I might say, as we look forward to the future, Our success, the sounds just resonate so strongly. And I know that you can feel in your heart that as we move forward, we're going to accomplish this goal. Visual, auditory, and aesthetic. As we look forward, auditory people, or visual people right away, are you talking to me? You can hear the strength of our power resonating. Auditory people, are you talking to me? And I know you can really feel what we're doing with this. So if I was to ask you guys to, um, this is a quick little drill. Everybody close your eyes, please. And I want you to imagine the home or place that you lived when you were eight years old. From the outside, you're looking at it, no emotion, you're just looking at it. Okay, and eyes open, please. How many of you actually saw it? Okay. How many didn't see it but kind of knew it was there? One. I'm that guy. I, I have a hard time visualizing it. I don't see it, but I kind of just, in a presence, typically it's about 40% are visual. Visual is the highest, auditory is the second, and kinesthetics the third. Okay, we're on trust. One way that you want to do that, going back to your, your question about the Constitution, mm -hmm. is you want to find ways to illustrate the ethics. Find ways to illustrate the rules in a, again, you want to illustrate, not explain. It's always a distinction. Explain, would you rather read a technical manual or a novel? No. A novel, so it's a lot more interesting. So you want to speak like a novel. So, you know, again, I, I, I pull on Barack. This will not be an administration that uses religion as a wedge or patriotism as a hammer. Now, that doesn't say what kind of administration it will be. It just says what it's not, because he knows right now he's tapping into some anger right there. He's illustrating, he, he's, um, he's illustrating ethics. Does that help you with that? All right, so, so as you go through your constitution, find ways that you can illustrate in certain points. So, so, so it's like, clause number three is like as though. So help people understand it. Do you guys ever work in groups with drills? Do you do drills together, that kind of stuff? Uh, well, let's do it real, real quickly. Kind of get that five volunteers right here. Real fast. This will be a quick drill, and then we'll wrap up. And this is a drill that will instantly improve your self-confidence. So these are the lucky ones. OK, who are you? Are you a volunteer on your shirt? You get to volunteer. OK, I need to circle around her, please. And you're right in the middle. Just circle around. Your job is to tell each one of these wonderful people about your school, or anything you want. In other words, the content of what you say is not important. Tell them about something you don't have to think about. 
you know, what do I do in school? What's my, what's my daily routine? Like I do with Jen, just tell me what you do in the morning. Okay, so it doesn't, what you say is not important. There's no right or wrong. Does that make sense to you? Okay, here's the deal. You must maintain eye contact with each one of them for five seconds. So guys, around the circle, your hand's gonna be just like this. Right? You're just gonna talk. So here's the thing. If you're talking to me, if your eyes waver from mine in any way like this or that or anything, I'm gonna keep my hand up. So as soon as you start talking, I'm gonna to count to five in my mind. One, two, three. If you keep eye contact for five straight seconds, I'm giving another point to the person next to me. You then turn, engage that person, continue to speak, and maintain eye contact. You make a full lap. Is that clear? Team, we clear? If her eyes leave your eyes, you start over at one. She's got to do five consecutive seconds. Go. And you starts over and over again until you get to that. But I would not start somebody with the and um drill. Just eye contact for five seconds. Remember, four stages of learning: unconscious and confidence, conscious and confidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what was your name again, please? Melissa. All right. Well, I'm going to give you a copy of my book. I'm happy to sign for you. This is the imposter syndrome, as I said. It's the feeling that you're not as smart, talented, or as attractive as everyone thinks you are. And it really, this is my story. We have some copies of this for sale at the booth for $20. I'd be happy to sign it for you and uh, address it for you. But as I wrap, gang, here's the deal. This is why I'm so focused on leadership. I could have done personal safety. I think I'm qualified for that. I could have done a lot of courses for colleges. I chose black belt leadership because in my lifetime, I've never seen a bigger need for leadership in our country than right now. And right now, you guys may just think like, okay, I'm this kid going to college. 10 years from now, you're gonna be in a serious place of leadership. I wanna help you get there. I wanna help you get your colleagues at your college there. I bring a different story. I, I don't imagine you guys have heard a leadership presentation quite like this. This was a little bit different. Because it's not theory, it's real. These kind of drills, I could do these all day long. with all kinds of fun drills that we can do to make the experience real. By doing these drills, you own the skill. I'm not crazy of straight lecture, we just didn't have a lot of room. I like to do lots of drills that help install the new programming immediately in your mind. So if you, like me, care about leadership in our country, if you, like me, care about leadership on your campus, and if you, like me, really want to improve your own life and learn to lead your self-talk and lead the direction in your destiny, you will book me at your school. I'm in Clearwater, Tampa Bay area of Florida. I'm extremely easy to work with. I've been doing this for years. I have a ball doing it. As you can tell, I really like what I'm doing. And I'm not, I'm not theoretical. Leaders are products of nurture, not nature. It's all about programming, and I can absolutely help you guys with that. I saw a hand back here. Any questions? Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Going back to uh, the concept you were talking about earlier, which is modeling. Yes. Um, how would you how would you counter program? Because I understand about you know you find someone who you admire and you model yourself to yourself after them. However, as you say, we have we already have set programs. How do we counter those things? Like um, say you 
wake up uh, new every day, and you don't want to do that anymore. Gotcha. Would you counter with, the, with something so that? So the question is, how do we change our program? Yeah. Fair? You have to, it, it, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. It is, you want to associate a lot of pain with continuing that program, continuing that pattern. Remember, programming leads to patterns of thought and behavior. All right, so for instance, what is the downside of sleep until noon? Where is this holding me back? You list that stuff out. Here's the question, and if you ask this question to yourself in virtually every aspect of your life, your life is gonna improve quicker. This is it. Will this decision be a short-term gain for long-term pain? Sleeping till noon is a short-term gain. Long-term pain is you uh, song for Harris. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense, you guys? Uh, eating ice cream every night is a short-term gain for the long-term pain of being extremely unhealthy. Skipping a workout, not training, not being, not, not taking care of yourself is a short-term gain for the long-term pain. Not studying and doing what needs to be done to really graduate well is a short-term gain for the long-term pain. Going to medical school for a decade of hell for a lifetime of prestige and wealth is short-term pain for long-term gain. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Flip side is short-term pain for long-term gain. Short-term pain of doing what needs to be done, what needs to be done. Short-term pain of getting up at eight for the long-term gain of freedom. Freedom's everything to me. When I was a kid, I, I knew my number one value was freedom. I was not going to get up to alarm clock. I was not going to answer anybody. It wasn't going to happen. So in order for that freedom to happen, I had to spend a solid 10 years without it. I had to be the guy that was not listening to commercial radio. I was listening to lectures and audio programs by the guys I wanted to mentor. I was the guy with my friends would go out partying, I was working on my curriculum. I did that for a decade. And I'd be, I told you my plastic surgeon friend, he said he was a millionaire at age 37, did I mention that to you? I had a private student, he was a plastic surgeon, he said he was a millionaire by age 37, I beat him by six months. I did that by doing exactly what I described to you. Here's the question, is this a short-term gain, long-term pain, or is this a short-term pain, long-term gain? You'll be surrounded by people who are under short-term gain, long-term pain. Stay away from them. When you hear people start to complain about the economy, complain about the government, complain about anything, you don't participate and you just walk away. Let them have that life. Remember the movie, ever seen the movie Caddyshack? Right? There's a scene where the guy is walking along, he's talking to the older guy, and he wants him to, he said, you know, my parents don't have money to send me to school. And the guy's response was, well, the world needs ditch diggers too. Let the people that are going short-term gain, long-term pain, let the people that are complaining constantly and bringing that negative energy around you, let them be the ditch diggers and carry on and really design the life that you want. Again, I'm John Graydon. I want to come to your school. Thank you guys so much. Evaluation forms, the drama box, and then I'll stamp your code.